sahana bhavatu sahano punaktu saha viryam karavavahai te jasve navadi tamastu ma vidvishavahai Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om, may Brahman protect us both. May he nourish us both. May we work together with great energy. May our study be vigorous and fruitful. May love and harmony dwell, dwell among us. Om, peace, peace. Peace unto all. Most of us have attended at least one extraordinary dance or musical performance that has been engraved on our memory. Now living at uh, the Dakshineshwar Temple Garden, Ramakrishna must have attended many such performances as um, artists would naturally deem it a privilege to perform there for the Divine Mother. Thus, he could very well uh, say from his own experience, he who has learnt to dance correctly never makes a false step. Or, an expert singer cannot sing a false note. As we ourselves can understand, such performers not only do not make a false step, but their performances also create an intense and often spiritual mood that is unforgettable we can very well understand that they have trained, them, trained themselves over a long period of time with great concentration and love in order to perfect their art. Yet the point Ramakrishna was making when he made those statements actually had nothing to do with wonderful performances as much as he might appreciate them. Rather, he was actually trying to clarify what true spiritual life is, and why self-effort is needed in spiritual life. In both instances, while referring to the dancer and to the singer, Ramakrishna was actually responding to a distorted view of being an instrument of God. In both of the incidents above, the person whom Ramakrishna was addressing tried to maintain that all our actions are God's will and that we are not responsible for any sins committed. In one case, a Brahmo devotee said to Ramakrishna, if it is God that makes me do everything, then I am not responsible for my sins. And Ramakrishna replied, yes, Duryodhana also said that. Duryodhana was the eldest of the 100 brothers who were uh, fighting the Pandavas in the Kurukshetra war. He said, yes, Duryodhana also said that. Um, I, O oh Krishna, I do what thou seated in my heart makest me do. If a person has the firm conviction that God alone is the doer and he is the Lord's instrument, then he cannot do anything sinful as Duryodhana had done. He who has learnt to dance correctly never makes a false step. Another day, a musician quoted these same words of Duryodhana to Ramakrishna, and the master gave this reply. Yes, that is true. It is God alone who acts through us. He is the doer, undoubtedly, and man is his instrument. But it is also true that an action cannot fail to produce its result. Your stomach will certainly burn if you eat hot chilies. If you commit a sin, you must bear its fruit. But one who has attained perfection, realized God, cannot commit sin. An expert singer cannot sing a false note. So it's the old question, is there any such thing as free will? Or is everything God's will, or even predestined? Ramakrishna was not denying that God is the doer and that we are instruments. In another place, he said, those who have realized God are aware that free will is a mere appearance. In reality, man is the machine and God its operator. Man is the carriage and God its driver. 
But he was at the same time saying that there's always going to be some result from our actions. And it is how we identify ourselves and what we choose to do or not do that determines the fruit of our actions. Ramakrishna is not saying that everything is predestined. There's a difference. After all, if everything is predetermined, why should we even try to realize God? If we are destined to realize God, we will. And if we are not, why make the attempt? Once while talking to Swami Saradananda and other disciples about the need for self-effort in spiritual life and whether or not human beings have free will, Ramakrishna answered this very objection. He said, is there anything, is there any free will for anyone? Everything is happening and will happen eternally by God's will. People understand this eventually. Let me give you an example. Here is a cow tied to a post with a long tether. She can walk one cubit from the post or up to a whole length of the tether. A person ties the cow with the intention of allowing her to lie down, stand, move around as she likes within that area. Man's free will is also like that. God has given some power to human beings and has also given them the freedom to use it as they wish. That is why people think they are free. But the rope is still fastened to the post. But let me tell you, if anyone intensely prays to God, he can move that person to another place with the same, with the same stake or extend the rope's length or even take the tether away completely. And Swami Saradananda said, well, at this we, we asked the master, sir, is it not then in human hands to practice spiritual disciplines? A person might simply say, whatever I do is according to God's will. The master replied, but what good does it do to say that? One may say, there is no thorn, no pricking, but one still cries out when one's hand is pricked by a thorn. If practicing spiritual disciplines were at one's discretion, everyone would practice them. Why don't they do it? If you don't properly use the power that God has given to you, he won't give you more. That is why one needs self-effort or perseverance. Look, everyone has to make some self-effort. Only then can one obtain God's grace. When one makes the effort by God's grace, 10 lifetimes of suffering are finished in one lifetime. But one must first make some effort, even while depending on him. We find in Ramakrishna's own life that he practiced intense austerities, yet at the same time he was totally surrendered to the Divine Mother. The Maharashtrian saint Sri Brahma Chaitanya of Gundawali also lived totally surrendered to the will of God. Whatever happened, he accepted as God's will. Yet, this is what he had to say about human will. Will is a great force in man. Man becomes what he wills. Therefore, we must direct our, God, our, we must direct our will Godward. We must desire to possess God with a will. The force of our will awakens God, and he has to come to us. The name of God generates this Godward will in man. So if our goal is to realize God, then we must make good use of the choices and of the power that God has given to us through his grace. And just as expert dancers and musicians intensely train with their whole being, so also saints and seers throughout history have practiced intense sadhana with their body, speech, and mind to realize God. Thus, we also must put to proper use our whole being in this spiritual sadhana. Only when, after proper training, our whole being is fully attuned to the divine do we become true instruments of the Lord and we realize that all is his will. 
Now, if we look at the Bhagavad Gita, a question arises. Is there some conflict here with what Krishna says in the Gita? In uh, verse 7-7, seven, seven, Krishna says, All this universe is strung on me like pearls on a string. And again, in verse 11-33, when Krishna shows his universal form to Arjuna, he tells him that all the warriors that, Krish that, that Arjuna is facing in battle have already been killed by him, that is, by Krishna himself, and that Arjuna should just be the instrument. That is to say, the deed has already been done, so where is Arjuna's choice in the matter? <laughs> Yet, in just the previous verse, 11.32, Krishna did give him a choice. He said that he himself, Krishna himself, is death and is responsible for killing all those warriors, and that even without Arjuna's involvement, the warriors will die. Again, in verse 1861, Krishna says, O oh, Arjuna, the Lord resides in the region of the heart of all creatures, revol revolving through Maya all creatures as though they were mounted on a machine. Now here, Madhusudana Sarasvati, one of the commentators of the Gita, presents an objection. Well, if God impels all the non-independent creatures, then it, am it amounts to this, that all the scriptures dealing with injunctions and prohibitions and all human efforts are useless. That is to say, what is the point of the scriptures telling us, do this, don't do that? Then Madhusudan Saraswati indicates, the answer to this objection is given by Krishna himself in the next two verses. There Krishna says, take refuge in him alone with your whole being, O scion of the Bharata dynasty. Through his grace, you will attain the supreme peace and eternal state. In this way, to you has been fully imparted by me the knowledge that is more secret than any secret. Pondering over this as a whole, do as you like. In his uh, comment and his explanation, Madhusuna Sarasvati adds, do as you like in accordance with your own eligibility but do not do anything whatsoever willfully without considering this teaching. In other words, with that element of a separate I that you feel you have, with that element of choice you feel, bring glory to your life by being an instrument as I have directed you. Krishna says again and again in the Gita, remember me and fight. It, he doesn't say, fight. <laughs> he says, remember me and fight. Keep your mind on me and fight. So in reality, the Gita is saying the same thing as Ramakrishna. Yes, everything is God's will, but there is also an element of choice on the individual level. This is not predestination. The Lord sees things and also works from a universal perspective and he knows what will be done and what needs to be done. Again, the Lord also knows what tendencies are there that will contribute to changes, such as Arjuna's warrior nature. But on our individual level, we have choices, just as Arjuna had. Now, when we analyze our actions, we find that there are three kinds done by human beings, totally selfish, totally selfless, and mixed. The first and third are done with a sense of ego, but the second is egoless, and this is what we are striving for. This helps us to become real instruments of the Lord. Now the following story told by Ramakrishna is a perfect illustration of where the confusion comes with being an ins instrument of the Lord. I'm sure you, you're familiar with this story, but I'll, I'll give it again. A Brahmin had worked very hard for a long time to create a beautiful garden, and he was extremely proud of it. 
One day, when he was away, a cow found the gate open and entered the garden. Now, finding many tasty plants, she went on and on devouring them until she had ruined a whole section of the garden. When the Brahmin returned from his errand, he was furious to see the damage that the cow had done and started beating her till, uh, till at last she fell down dead. Only then did the Brahmin wake up to the seriousness of what he had done, for, uh, as you know, among Hindus, it is a sin to kill a cow. But when the sin came to enter his body, the Brahmin became afraid and said, my hand is controlled by Indra. So Indra killed the cow, not me. Go to him. Now, as some of you know, in some philosophies of India, just as natural forces like fire, water, air, each has a presiding deity. So in the same way, each of the organs of the body and each of the parts of the body also has a presiding deity. And Indra is the presiding deity of the hand. So the sin went to Indra, Indra and tried to enter him. At this, Indra protested. After finding out from the sin what had happened, Indra asked the sin to wait while he talked to the Brahmin. <laughs> Indra then came to the garden disguised as a Brahmin and began to stroll around, loudly praising the beauty of the garden. Hearing someone appreciating his work, the, the gardener came over and started giving Indra a personal tour showing him the various plants and flowers and shrubs. Indra continually asked the gardener, who did this? Who planted these? Who arranged all this so beautifully? And the Brahmin gardener invariably answered, sir, I did this. I planted these. I arranged all this. <laughs> then suddenly they came to the part of the garden where the cow lay dead. Pretending to be shocked, Indra asked, Oh, and who has killed the cow? <laughs> the Brahmin then realized that he had been continually taking credit for all, everything good that had been done, and now he could not reply. At this, Indra assumed his real farm and said, So, the credit for the, all the good is yours, but you put this, the blame for killing the cow on me. Here, take your sin. It is yours. <laughs> Then the sin for killing the cow uh, entered the Brahmin. So the idea is, if we work with a sense of ego, we will get both the good and the bad results of our actions. There's no way to avoid it. We cannot take credit for the good and put the blame for the bad on God, saying that we are but instruments of the Lord. Moreover, if we follow Ramakrishna's idea further here, we will understand that the Brahman could not have killed the cow at all if he were really being an instrument. It was the ego with all its baggage, with its emotional baggage that was there, and this prevented him from being a true instrument. So how do we become a true instrument of the divine? Various scriptures give us guidelines for our actions, but it is up to us to assimilate them. There are, for instance, moral codes that are basic and required for all people everywhere, whether one believes in God or not. These are meant to gradually purify the mind and make it ready for spiritual practices. But for devotees, for those who want to realize God and live a spiritual life, there are, in addition, instructions on practices that are intended to help us attain the goal. They are meant to attune our body, speech, and mind to the divine. We should look at two of these instructions here, both from the Srimad Bhagavatam. First, there are Prahlada's nine aspects of devotion. Hearing about God, singing about him, remembering him, serving him, worshiping him, saluting him, being his servant, being his friend, and surrendering oneself and everything that is one's own to him. 
Later in the Bhagavatam, we find a prayer by the two sons of Kubera, the god of wealth, who had been released by Krishna from a curse that had turned them into trees. After resuming their divine forms, they sang a hymn of praise to Krishna and then prayed, May our speech be ever engaged in the narration of thy glories. May our ears be ever engaged in hearing about thee. May our hands be ever engaged in thy work. May our minds always remain at thy feet. May our heads always bow in reverence at thy abode, this whole universe. And may our eyes always see thy devotees who are the embodiments of thee. Now, to some people, these practices may appear somewhat simplistic or superficial, but there is actually a great psychology behind them. The whole idea in both of these instructions is to get our body, mind, and speech all involved in this pursuit of God-realization. The purification that takes place through these disciplines cannot help but awaken the Lord within. It is like the simile of pouring water in an ink pot to clear out the ink. If you continually pour the water in the ink pot, eventually the ink will all be removed. So also, if you keep your body, speech, and mind occupied in the pursuit of God realization, your impurities and barriers to the Lord will eventually be removed. Now, before we look at these practices, let's take a quick look at how much power our ordinary speech actions and thoughts have in our daily life. For instance, we see day after day how hurtful words can cause pain to others. It does not take much to see the power in them. Again, we all know the feeling that just a few kind words can produce. Then think how much more our physical actions can cause grief or happiness. Our thoughts, too, are not immune from having their effects. Even if harmful thoughts do not hurt others, they certainly can hurt us. Now let's think about these things in terms of our spiritual practices. First, we shall consider speech. Though most mantras are normally repeated mentally, we shall consider them here under speech. Because singing and uh, chanting praises are also like mantras too. But here just uh, we're speaking about regular mantras too. Many, many of us have received a mantra from a guru, or maybe we repeat a name of God as a mantra. We have been told that the mantra has power. In fact, saints testify again and again that the mantra is powerful enough to take us to God. Now, if our ordinary words, thoughts, and actions have so much power, just imagine how much more power this mantra must have. Yet often we find that people do not have much faith in it. This is because the mantra is such a subtle thing, and so its power, and so is its power. It is very difficult to comprehend how such a subtle thing works. Ramakrishna often spoke about the effects of repeating the name of God. Once he said, if a person repeats the name of God, his body, mind, and everything become pure. Have faith in his name. Again, he said, there is a great power in the seed of God's name. It destroys ignorance. A seed is tender and the sprout soft. Still, it pierces the hard ground. The ground breaks and makes way for the sprout. Swami Satprakashananda used to describe how at the time of initiation when one receives a mantra from the guru, it is as if the guru has planted a seed in one's heart. It is up to us then to water and nourish that seed by repeating it, and not just by repeating it mechanically, but repeating it with faith and devotion. 
If this is done, then the seed will eventually sprout and grow into a beautiful plant with flowers and fruits. The flowers are our spiritual experiences, and the fruit is our liberation. But patience is necessary, just as one cannot expect a seed to sprout and grow in one day, so also we cannot expect results quickly from our japa. Again, Ramakrishna said, God and his name are identical. There is no difference between Rama and his holy name. Now, how is it possible that the name of God and God himself are one and the same? Because a mantra is made of a series of sounds, which, as we repeat them, take the form of subtle waves. Now, if we see sounds on a special recording device, we will see that each sound creates a particular wave. Yet according to science, every material thing in this universe is also composed of waves, waves and particles. One moment they are seen as waves and the next moment as particles. Everything is both at the same time. Now what finer wave could there be than the personal God? So if the name of the Lord and the Lord himself are both waves, then those waves of the mantra and the waves of the form are identical. Regarding the process of this, Swami Vivekananda says in Bhakti Yoga, in the, in the individual man, the thought waves rising in the limited mind must manifest themselves first as words and then is the more concrete forms. Moreover, as Swamiji says regarding mantras, the same personal God can and does take various manifestations, and each of these manifestations, therefore, must have a particular word symbol to express it. These word symbols evolved out of the deepest spiritual perception of sages symbolize and express as nearly as possible the particular view of God and the universe they stand for. And they are all helpful to divine meditation and the acquisition of true knowledge. <clears throat> now, in addition, one must have faith in and reverence for the guru has, who has graciously planted that mantra in us. One should also have faith in the sanctity and power of the mantra itself, as well as love for and faith in the aspect of God whose mantra we have been given. The, the Sri Vaishnava commentator Pillai Lokacharya also says, if one has abundant love for the mantra, for the subject of the mantra, that is the aspect of the Lord indicated by the mantra, and for the acharya who bestows the mantra, it will succeed. Now going back to Prahlada's instructions, he suggests that we hear about the Lord and sing about him. These are the two aspects he mentions regarding speech. The two sons of Kubera also advise us May our speech be ever engaged in the narration of thy glories. May our ears be ever engaged in hearing about thee. So besides repeating mantras, singing devotional songs, saying prayers, chanting hymns or reading from or listening to readings of the scriptures, these are immensely helpful in developing devotion. And these two are like mantras in the sense that they help us to focus our mind on God. Turning our ordinary conversations Godward is good, but of course it is not always possible. We are not always with like-minded people. But another very important point that goes with perfecting our speech is to speak the truth. Ramakrishna emphasized this again and again. He said, if a person holds to truth, he will certainly realize God. 
He also said, truthfulness in speech is the tapasya of the Kali Yuga. It is difficult to practice other austerities in this age. By adhering to truth, one attains God. Tulsidas said, truthfulness, obedience to God, and the regarding of others' wives as one's mother are the greatest virtues. If one does not realize God by practicing them, then Tulsi is a liar. Now, how is it possible that one can attain God simply by speaking the truth? Because by speaking the truth, we align our whole being with Ritta, the cosmic moral order. Ritta is a, a very ancient word, a, a, from a Vedic word. It's kind of the predecessor of the word Dharma. It's, but it has a little more universal meaning to it. It's the cosmic moral order of the universe. So that which is true is a vibration which is in tune with Ritta. On the other hand, a false vibration cannot be attuned to Ritta. Yet, as mentioned before, our speech must be beneficial and must not cause harm to others. This also aligns us with Ritta. In effect, we should try to keep in mind that all our words are like mantras. They are not, of course, man all mantras for God realization, yet our words can still take us either closer to or farther from God. So just as an expert singer trains his or her voice, these are the ways in which we should train our speech to help us realize God. Now, in the same way, we can think of our physical movements with our body as being like the mudras of a worshiper or of a dancer who is performing a sacred dance. Everything we do with our body has consequences. Our actions may be good, they may be bad, or they may be neutral. And just as our speech can make us more attuned to Rita, the cosmic moral order, or less attuned, so also can our actions. Now, if we have a routine and generally do the same thing every same things every day, we can almost feel as if our movements are choreographed. And if we have a routine with regard to our spiritual practices, such as doing them regularly in the mornings and the evenings, this can be especially good. This choreography itself helps us stick to our routine and keeps us focused on our spiritual practices. Prahlada's instructions to serve the Lord, worship him, and salute him can be taken two ways. Per performing actual service and worship and salutations in a shrine or temple, or else serving, worshiping, and saluting human beings as manifestations of God. Or we can take these instructions in both ways. As Ramakrishna himself said in uh, Swami Vivekananda also used to emphasize, if God can be seen, if God can be worshipped through a clay image, then why not through a human being? Now, the same goes for the prayer of the sons of Kubera. May our hands be ever engaged in thy work. May our heads always bow in reverence at thy abode, this whole universe. And may our eyes always see thy devotees who are the embodiments of these. So using our body in our devotional practices makes these practices stronger and firmer in our mind. It imprints them, as it were, on the mind. So now we come to our practices on the mental level. This is the most important and sometimes the most difficult part. The idea here is if we have tra trained our speech and body well, we will have less difficulty with our mind. Yet it is also our mind that must train our body and speech. So we must have a well-trained mind. <laughs> this is where Prahlada's instructions come to our rescue. He says, remembering the Lord, living as his servant, 
living as his friend and surrendering oneself and all that one has to him. And also the instructions of the sons of Kubera. May our minds always remain at thy feet. Now, it may seem as if remembering the Lord is the only one that fits this category, but actually the others are wonderful attitudes that help us train our minds and develop devotion. So this is why they are included here. Regarding remembering the Lord, Smarana, Ramanuja gives a wonderful commentary on this in his Sri Bhaisha, his uh, commentary on the Brahma Sutras. He equates remembrance, in fact, to both meditation and seeing the Lord. He says, meditation, again, is a constant remembrance of the object meditated upon, like a continuous stream of oil being poured from one vessel to another without a break in the flow. This form of remembering is as good as is as good as seeing. Remembrance, when exalted, assumes the same form as seeing or direct perception. In other words, it takes you to samadhi, where you get direct perception of the Lord. That Ramanuja then quotes from the Gita. Those, Krishna says, those who are constantly attached to me and worship me with devotion, I give that direction to their mind by which they come to me. In other words, if you are constantly putting your mind on me, my grace will come, come to you. And here Ramanuja comments, therefore we conclude that he to whom this constant remembrance, which is exalted to the height of direct perception, is dear, because the object of that remembrance is dear, he is loved by the self, and by him the self is realized. This constant remembrance, which is the same as knowing, practiced throughout life, is the only means to the realization of Brahman. So we can see remembrance and meditation are extremely important to Ramanuja because meditation, that is this constant remembrance, smarana, not only awakens the consciousness of the divine within us, it also, in fact, awakens the divine in us. The divine gradually becomes a living presence within us in a very real sense. And this is the purpose of repeating the mantra also. But for the practice of remembrance and meditation, it is also important that we have the right attitude. This is why the sons of Kubera say, may our minds always remain at thy feet. And this is why Prahlada also adds, living as his servant living as his friend and surrendering oneself and all that one has to him. So a personal relationship with God that involves humility, trust, dependence, and intimacy is necessary in order to maintain this remembrance and meditation. By surrendering our ego to the Lord and living as his servant, we begin to remove the distance between ourself and God. Our pride and ego are nothing but a barrier separating us from the Lord. So living as a servant of the Lord and surrendering oneself and everything that one has to the Lord, as well as mentally placing our feet, our head at, the, at his feet, these are perfect attitudes to cultivate to remove this barrier of the ego While living as a friend of the Lord puts less emphasis on the attitude of humility, yet there is a little more intimacy involved in the attitude of a friend, and this also removes the barriers to the Lord. So when these attitudes are firmly settled in the mind, then everything else comes automatically, including remembrance and meditation. 
And again, when remembrance and meditation become firm, then our mind is an expert trainer for our body and speech. Now, if we look closely at Ramakrishna's life, we find that he is probably the greatest example of the expert dancer known to the modern world. But we should also keep in mind here that Ramakrishna was not an ordinary spiritual aspirant. His sadhana's teachings and actions were not for himself or just for a few people. They were for the good of the whole world. All that, although that seems to put him in a different category, we still find him to be the perfect guide for us. First, we can give an example of how Ramakrishna could not take a false step, even unknowingly. Once, when a devotee named Shambhu Malik was visiting the master at the temple garden, he heard that Ramakrishna was having some stomach trouble, so he offered to give him some medicinal opium for it. Later that day, the master went to Shambhu's house, which was close to the temple garden, to get the, mas to get the medicine from him. But as Shambhu was not in the dispensary then, the dispensary supervisor gave it to him. However, when Ramakrishna tried to return to the temple garden, he could not find the path back. It was a path that he had taken many times. <laughs> Yet this time he could not see it. Moreover, he kept stumbling as if someone were pulling his legs back, trying to take him back to Shambhu's house. Now, after trying several times to return to the temple garden, Ramakrishna at last realized that he had no right to take the medicine from the supervisor as Shambhu had told him to take it from him, Shambhu himself. And the supervisor also did not have Shambhu's permission to give it to him. So the master felt his actions, action was wrong on two counts. For that reason, the Divine Mother would not allow him to return to the temple with the medicine. So he immediately went back to return it. Later, while relating this incident to some of his disciples, Ramakrishna explained, I have completely surrendered myself to the, to the mother, so she is holding my hand all the time. She never allows me to take a false step. So here, the master exemplifies both steadfastness in truth and total surrender to the divine. As Ramakrishna had surrendered everything to the Lord, he lived simply as a child of the Divine Mother, even when he was dying of throat cancer. To him, that also was the Mother's will. Swami Abedananda said that when the Master developed cancer in his throat and was living at the Kasipur Garden House for treatment, Pandit Shashadar came to see him one day and said to him, Sir, you are a great yogi. If you put your mind on your throat a little, your cancer will surely be cured. The master replied, How can the mind that I have already offered to the Lord be diverted again to the body of flesh and blood? In other words, it would be like stealing back something that one had already given away. Swami Abedananda then said, but still, Shashadar pleaded with him, Sir, then when you talk to the Divine Mother, please ask her to cure your cancer. <laughs> it's a good try. <laughs> then the Master replied, but When I see the Mother of the Universe, I forget my body in the Universe. So how can I tell the Mother about this insignificant body of flesh and blood? So Ramakrishna's total surrender to the Divine Mother included his ego. Often when Ramakrishna heard about people with noble qualities, he would go to their homes without even being invited. We may think this strange, but as Swami Saradananda said, this thought never occurred to him. I am a great man. If I were to visit someone in this manner, I would cheapen myself and lose my prestige. 
No, he had completely burnt his ego and vanity to ashes and consigned them forever to the Ganga. When beggars were fed in the Kali temple, he carried their dirty leaf plates on his head, dumped them outside, and cleaned the place where they had eaten. Once he, he even ate the food left by those beggars, considering, considering them to be Narayana. He washed the outhouse that the servants and workers of the Kali temple used. While wiping that place with his hair, he prayed, Mother, may I never feel that I am superior to them. Again, more than once, Ramakrishna was mistaken for a gardener of the temple and was asked to pluck flowers for the visitors. He always gladly picked the flowers for them and never corrected them. <laughs> According to his disciples, it was because of Ramakrishna's total lack of ego and identity with the lower self that all of his actions were beautiful. Once Ramakrishna was visiting Balarambosa's house and he began to speak about a woman devotee named Gopalarma and her visions of baby Gopala, a baby Krishna. After praising her great devotion, he asked that someone bring her there to the gathering at Balaram's house. As soon as Balaram heard this, he sent someone in a carriage to get her. Now, shortly before the carriage with Gopalarama arrived, Ramakrishna went into an ecstatic state and assumed the pose of Gopala begging for butter. It's a little baby on all fours with his hand up like this. When Gopalar Ma came inside the room, the devotees present understood that it was because of Gopalar Ma's intense devotion that brought about this sudden manifestation of Gopala in the master. Swami Sardananda witnessed this scene himself, and after describing it, he commented, before we, came, before we became acquainted with the master, we thought that Although people love to see children dance and make gestures, it disgusts them to, or seems ludicrous if a robust man acts that way. When we came to the master, we had to change our views. Although the master was advanced in age, when he danced and sang and made gestures, they were so sweet and beautiful. And it was remarkably beautiful when he assumed the posture of Gopala while in ecstasy that day at Balaram's house. We did not understand why it looked so beautiful. We only felt it to be so. Now we know that the, the master completely identified with any mood that came over him. There was not a trace of any other mood in him, nor any insincerity or pretension. He was so inspired and absorbed in that mood that he would become dissolved in it. At that time, no one could perceive that an older man was acting like a boy. The current of his spiritual mood would burst forth from within and completely transform his body. Now, besides the issue of Ramakrishna's total lack of ego in this state, I think we can understand here that Swami Sardananda is also equating Ramakrishna's life of absolute truth with his ability to make himself one with any mood. Being established in truth and the ability to become totally absorbed in a spiritual mood were to Swami Sardananda the same. As he said, there was not a trace of insincerity about it. It's... The master's disciples saw this steadfastness and truth not only in his words, but, it, but many times in his actions. Swami Sardananda described this also while writing about the master's daily routine. If the master said he would do something at a certain time, he was anxious to do it as planned. If he said he would accept something from a particular person, he would receive it from none other than that person rather than be guilty of a falsehood. 
Even if this caused great inconvenience to himself, he endured it rather than break his word. Now, describing the master's love for the names of God, Swami Shivananda once said, One night at 1 a.m., the master came out to the veranda where I was sleeping and asked, Could you chant the name of Gopala for me? I chanted for an hour. Some nights when he did not have anybody around him, he would call the night guard to chant the name of Rama for him. What love the master had for the name of God. We saw how little the master slept. Now and then he might get an hour or half an hour of sleep at the most. Most of the time he was absorbed in samadhi and the remaining time he spent in various spiritual moods. These moods became very pronounced at night. He would spend the whole night repeating the, night, the name of Mother or Hari. When we stayed with the Master at Dakshinishra, we were filled with awe. He had no sleep at all. Whenever we awoke, we would hear him talking with the Divine Mother in a state of spiritual inebriation. He would pace back and forth in the room, all the while muttering something inaudibly. Some days he would start kirtan accompanied by drums and cymbals, and we would join him. Usually he would sing only the names of God, occasionally improvising words and phrases. He had an unusually sweet voice, the like of which we never heard anywhere else. The kirtan would continue till the late hours of the morning. The master's ecstasies were contagious, making all those around him ecstatic, and the constant repetition of the Lord's name made the place a heaven on earth. In what joy we passed our days with the Master. So from the above, we can see what it means to live as a perfect instrument of the Lord. One is constantly united with the divine. In the Leela Prasanga, Swami Sardananda described two instances of the master's ecstatic dancing. One was during a kirtan at Moni Moloch's house, and the other, the one we'll describe here, took place uh, during the master's last visit to the annual festival at Panihati. Ramakrishna and the devotees were listening to a kirtan party that had come to perform in front of the temple situated in the courtyard of Mani Sen's house. Now, uh, on this Panihati festival, there are many kirtan groups. They all start at Mani Sen's house. There's a courtyard there with a, uh, like a up stage thing, and you jump, you go down into the courtyard to get to in front of the temple. Um, from there, each, you know, each kirtan party starts there, sings uh, to the deities at Mani Sen's temple in his courtyard. Then from there, each of the kirtan parties goes to um, Raghav Pandit's house. Raghav Pandit was a disciple of Chaitanya, and he, uh, Chaitanya spent at least once, may, uh, probably twice, he uh, stayed at Raghav Pandit's house. It's not far from Calcutta. Uh, of course, there was no Calcutta then. <laughs> so, um, so that's how the arrangement is. The Kirtan Bardis go from Mani Sen's house to Raghav Pandit's house. The distance between the two, you could easily walk it in 10 minutes. Probably five minutes is more like the, the, how it would take just to walk there. It took... I'll tell you, it took this kirtan party three hours to get there with Ramakrishna's dancing. Three hours. <laughs> so what happened was Ram, the, the kirtan, the, kirtan, the um, Ramakrishna had promised his disciples, he was at the very first stage of his throat cancer, he, had, he was not feeling well, so he had promised his disciples, no, he would not sing or dance. Uh, 
something overwhelmed him. He jumped down into the courtyard and started, went off. <laughs> I think he said he would try not to. I, 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 he wouldn't have broken his word. <laughs> but I think he would try not to sing or dance. So the, the kirtan, this one kirtan party started. The Ramakrishna then suddenly went down, jumped down into the midst of him and went into samadhi. And Swami Saradananda said, Ramakrishna then regained partial consciousness, consciousness and began to dance as powerfully as a lion and again lost external consciousness and stood still. He went in and out of samadhi like this for some time. As he danced his ecstatic dance, he moved rapidly and rhythmically forward and backward as if he were a fish joyfully swimming and moving in a sea of bliss. It is impossible to describe how this emotion manifested itself in every limb of his body, revealing strength <laughs> blended with an extraordinary softness and sweetness and an unbounded bliss. We have seen many men and women dance enchantingly with various gestures, but we have never seen before such beauty mixed with gentleness and strength as was manifested in the master when he danced exuberantly, lost in ecstasy. Overflowing with ecstatic bliss, his body would swing and move as though it were not made of any hard stuff, such as bones. Rather, it was, if, it was as if a tidal wave had arisen from the ocean of bliss and were vigorously sweeping everything away before it and would again become liquid and disappear from sight. We do not remember ever having seen the master display such a luminous beauty in samadhi as he did that day. It is beyond human power to properly describe the extraordinary beauty of his divine form. We never could have imagined a human body changing in a moment of ecstasy. We saw the master's tall figure every day, but on that day it appeared to grow even taller and become weightless, like a body seen in a dream. His slightly dark complexion became brighter and turned golden. The divine mood shone on his face and illumined everything around him. When people saw his incomparable smile, a combination of grace, compassion, peace, and joy, they forgot everything and followed him spellbound. The beautiful color of his skin blended with the bright ochre color of his silk wearing cloth so that it seemed as if he were enveloped in flames. So one who is an expert dancer is always immersed in divine bliss. And that bliss is God itself. All of Ramakrishna's movements flowed from his total connection to his total oneness with the divine. He had surrendered his body, speech, and mind so totally that he, could not, that he was not separate from the divine. As said before, Ramakrishna was not an ordinary spiritual aspirant. He came for the good of the world. Though he did not expect us to do everything he did, we should still understand that his actions are guides for us. Swami Vivekananda also urged us to take Ramakrishna's life as a mold and that we should cast ourselves in this mold. Swamiji once quoted from The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, who said, the life of anybody who truly loves the Lord will be molded in his pattern. And Swamiji commented on this. Therefore, whether we truly love the master or not will be proven by this. Ramakrishna has shown us the way. He has, in fact, designed the whole choreography. Now it is up to us to try and follow in his steps and to cast ourselves in his mold. Om Purnamada Purnamidang Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya 
Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Aum Shanti 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 Aum That Brahman is infinite. This Brahman as the universe is infinite. The infinite proceeds from the infinite. Taking the infinite from the infinite, it remains the infinite Brahman alone. Om, peace, peace, peace unto all. <laughs>